I might be a first being prayed for by way of a backhand compliment. We'll see. So let's, uh, let's open the word together, shall we? I'm afraid I don't have any of those edible clouds uh, that they're having in the other groups, but uh, we, shall, um, we shall have a lovely time together thinking through um, the story of the Exodus. And, uh, and if, you've, um, if you've been with us over the last uh, few weeks, I hope you've been enjoying um, our study through the Exodus as much as me. Uh, I'm really enjoying this current series. And, uh, and if you um, were here last week, you would have heard Ed um, speak um, about the gripping story of, uh, of God's deliverance and his rescue of his people out of slavery and into freedom, particularly, um, particularly from the plagues. And so we've got a fancy little graphic that can move across there, uh, looking at this, this whole um, area of, of the Exodus. And, and so as Ed was looking there at the plagues, um, that was, you know, an epic story. Um, but in some ways, this week is no different from that, because we're looking at um, the story of the crossing of the Red Sea, or of the Reed Sea, uh, depending on uh, how you look at it. And, uh, and, you know, you'd have to work quite hard to overestimate the importance of this story to the rest of the Bible. Uh, if you go to the Psalms and you start flicking through the Psalms, you'd struggle, I think, to get past any one page where there's not some kind of reference to this crossing of the Red Sea and how God's people were saved uh, from their enemy, um, the, the Egyptians. You know, if you start looking into the pages of the New Testament, there are tons of references to um, this crossing of the Red Sea. And it does seem like if ever there was a passage where people were encouraging you to think about not only um, the importance of the crossing of the Red Sea for God's people, the Israelites, it also seems to be a passage that in the New Testament we're encouraged to read backwards and to reflect on the difference that Jesus has made, his saving work in our lives. And we see that reflected through this uh, story of uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. Let me just give you a quick example of that. You know, I'm in my uh, Bible reading at the moment, I've been reading through uh, Hebrews, wonderful book. And uh, in Hebrews 11, um, it uses these words. It says, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, uh, they were drowned. It says there that it was by faith that the Israelites passed through that sea and that it was somehow that with the Egyptians who couldn't do it, it was because they didn't have faith. It's very clear here that Hebrews 11 is talking in the context, wonderful chapter, talking in the context of Christian faith. And this idea that the Red Sea is a pattern or a model for us thinking about our faith. If you look in, um, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, it uses a similar example there to talk about how um, just having spoken a few verses before about the crossing of the Red Sea, that these things happened to them, the Israelites, as examples. They were written down as warnings for us. These things were written for us. What we see here is the Red Sea is, if you like, a paradigm, a model, a pattern for thinking about faith, thinking about the journey that we are on, thinking about what God has done for us, is doing for us, and will do um, for us. It's a wonderful passage. And so we're going to read a load of it now. Bet you're glad, aren't you? 27 verses or so. Um, so if you've got your Bible, why don't you turn with me to Exodus uh, chapter 14. And uh, you might have that either electronically. Um, if you're after a physical Bible, do, do sort of put your hands up because we can, we can grab some for you uh, if you'd like, including brand new extra large print Bibles. I know. So if anyone would like one of those. Well, we might run out, but there's, there, there's one there, David. Well done. There's only two. David's got one of them. Um, and uh, they are very satisfying, as we said, uh, reading through. So do grab one of those. Have a little look uh, in your own time. So Exodus chapter 14. And um, we're going to read from verse Five. I've got the words on the screen here as well, of course, for you. So when the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them. So Pharaoh has let God's people go. 
he's let them go out into, uh, into the wilderness to worship their God. And now he has a change of heart, a ch- or at least a change of mind. Uh, he said this, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with the other chariots of Egypt. That's quite a lot of chariots, uh, with officers over all of them. Uh, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. And the Egyptians and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi hari opposite uh, baal Zephon. Uh, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here into the desert to die? What have you done to us? By bringing us out of Egypt. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? Did they? Interesting, read back, be interested to see whether they actually said that. Uh, It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. And Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that he'll bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. And the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the waters so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. It's easy, it's obvious, come on. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so we'll go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And then the angel of of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front. They've been following God's pillar of cloud in front of them and goes behind them to stand behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. And so throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. And so neither um, uh, neither went near the other all night long. God's people protected in the light the Egyptians in darkness. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, all 600 of them plus the rest, and horsemen, followed them into the sea. And during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and the cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let us get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians in their chariots and horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at the daybreak, the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had been followed, uh, following the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. And so the people here have escaped Egypt 
so that they can worship God. And they've seen God do amazing works of deliverance for his people through uh, bringing of those plagues. And and here we see um, God's people now, however, backed into a bit of a corner. Pharaoh has changed his mind and he's decided that actually he'd very much like the Israelites to come back. He liked their services, it says we read uh, there. Um, He liked them. And so he goes to ask very nicely for them to return to him, taking his 600 horses and chariots and troops with him just to kind of help to reinforce that pretty please uh, for the Israelites to uh, come back. And uh, in verse 10, we see here uh, a bit like this sheep. Uh, God's people are between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, they have the Red Sea right in front of them. And right behind them, they have uh, Pharaoh asking very nicely if they would return with him. One way or the other, in the coffin or again as his slaves. And we see there a slightly odd reference. Um, if, you, if you're like me, it reads slightly odd anyway, that, that actually it says here that God hardens Pharaoh's heart in verse 8. Uh, he hardens his heart. And it seems to be a, a heavy hint here that God is engineering this situation. It's, if you like, a bespoke situation to trap Pharaoh, Uh, but also to display the fact that the Israelites themselves are helpless. They are powerless in and of themselves to get away or to get out of this situation. They are powerless to help themselves. And so we read there that they are terrified and they cry out to God for help. If you ever felt trapped, if you've ever felt in a situation where you think, um, if God doesn't turn up in this situation, I am stuffed. That is a very healthy place to be. Actually, what we find in those situations, and as we find for ourselves in situations in which we can say, hang on a minute, God, I've just seen you do amazing things, and yet now it feels like you've just led me out here into this place where I'm between a rock and a hard place. I am trapped. I'm in trouble. It can be very easy for us, just like these Israelites, to to respond in much the same way, both to cry out, to be terrified about our situation, but also very quickly for that to lead to a disappointment with God. How on earth, God, could you let this happen to me? If you found yourself saying those words, you, you would be in good company here with the Israelites. They've been freed from slavery. But it doesn't feel like they're fully free yet. It doesn't feel like they're fully free yet. And so what we see here is there is more to the Israelite slavery than initially meets the eye. And just like you peel back the layers of an onion and you find there's another layer there, what we see here is that the slavery that the Egyptians had subjected these Israelites to was one that was um, multi-layered. It had lots of layers to it. And the people's response in verse 12 shows us that their hearts were still not fully free from the slavery that they had been under. They say to Moses, you know, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? They they don't say that at any point particularly. Uh, There's a bit of a reference to that in in chapter 5, verse 21, but, but nothing like this. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. And it's not the last time that they are going to use um, words to that effect. What on earth are we doing? Why have we found ourselves here? And these um, verses, um, particularly sort of verses 10 to 12 here, introduce this pointing pattern for the people of Israel and their behavior, where when everything's going well, they obey God. But when there's the slightest hint of trial or discomfort, they complain and they want to go back to Egypt. Just uh, in the the following chapters, we read of God's people needing food. 
Uh, and they say, oh, I didn't, didn't, back in Egypt, we had all sorts to eat back there. And we see God amazingly providing manna for his people, heavenly food for them to eat. We see God's people complaining to Moses, asking for more water, for refreshment. And even Moses himself gets so frustrated with the people, he takes, uh, takes things into his own hands and strikes a rock and water gushes forth from that rock. What we see here for the Egyptians is any, in any moment where they suffer some level of trial or discomfort, they find themselves longing for slavery again, longing for Egypt. But before we cast the first stone, before we're too quick to uh, point out the Israelites' error, we do well to remember that I, certainly, and I'm sure each of you, when things get a bit tough, when you are in a period of, of discomfort, and I don't want to underplay this, but, you know, sometimes, you know, you go on holiday, it rains. <laughs> Your cat dies. And you find yourself questioning the very basis of your faith. For some of you, though, it, things have happened in your lives that are far more <laughs> serious than it raining whilst you're on holiday. Things far more serious than your pet cat or your hamster uh, passing away. And yet you have found yourself in that place of disappointment with God, that point, uh, that point of, of questioning the whole basis of your faith. And just as I said a couple of weeks ago of, this, of these Egyptians and these Israelites, the, the same is true today. You know, you, you could take God's people out of slavery, but it would take 40 years to take slavery out of God's people. And what we see here and we see throughout the Exodus story and far beyond is a people that need to learn those, as the message says, those unforced rhythms of grace. You know, Ed introduced us uh, last week to some very fancy uh, words, justification and sanctification. And um, if you were here uh, last week, you would have heard his, his explanation of these, that, that actually, you know, if we put our faith in Jesus... If we put our faith in him, we are justified. And he used that phrase that it was kind of just as if we hadn't sinned. We, um, in a legal sense, are kind of acquitted. We are declared right before God. Sin no longer separates us from God. Uh, the New Testament uh, language is, is a bit like this. It says, you know, we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Interesting in this passage, we talk about the Egyptians being in darkness and, and, uh, and the Israelites being in light. We've been transferred. You know, if, if, you, um, if you've ever found yourself in a job and you hand in your notice and you leave that employment and go and work somewhere else, if your old boss picks up the phone, rings you up and says, why didn't you come into work this morning? It's a Monday morning, you should be here. You could be quite right to say, I no longer work for you. I am no longer under your employment. God's people here and us are transferred from one situation into another one. And that's why we can say, along with Paul, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have been freed. But just as it's true um, for these Israelites, it's true for us, that we can be free, if you like, from that penalty of sin. There is still a pull of sin uh, in our lives. And this whole process of sanctification, of God's ongoing work in our lives to help us to look more and more and more like Jesus, is radically important. It's that process in which God works into our lives in deeper, at deeper levels into our life, his work to help us to look more and more like Jesus in the way we live, the things we say, and uh, in who we worship. 
And in Romans 6, it uses these words, that we are free from sin. And yet Paul very quickly then says, so don't sin. You are free from sin. You are justified. So don't sin any more. Believing but not believing can be the experience of our lives. Knowing but wondering whether we really know can be a common experience for us. And here we see Israel have escaped the power of slavery of Pharaoh. But they are not fully free. You know, sometimes these, these words are described as kind of there's, there are three tenses of uh, salvation. We have been saved. We are being saved. And the one that's not on here, glorification, is we will be saved. We have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved. It's a multi-step process. And this is the one that the Israelites find themselves in. So how do they get out of it? How do they get away from uh, being between this rock and this hard place? How do they get out? Well, it's not just that they have to, um, the people have to get through the Red Sea. They have to find a way through it. And what do they have to do? Well, we read here uh, in verses 13 and 14 what God uh, encourages them to do. It says, Moses answered the people. And Moses says to the people, don't be afraid. Easy to say that, isn't it? Don't be afraid. Stand firm and you'll see the deliverance of the Lord that he'll bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, will uh, you'll never see again, quite literally. The Lord will fight for you and you need only to be still. The way through for the Egyptians is in these words, to stand firm and to be still. It's what uh, we often describe as grace. It's not that these people are frozen to the spot with fear. Do they physically move? Yes, they do. (laughs) They move through. But I like to think about it a bit like this. You know, um, know, our daughter... Um, she loves to um, play the teacher at the moment. She's in the world of being a teacher. And so whenever she's at home, she is lining up her teddies uh, and she is getting one of our laptops and, uh, and she is running a lesson for her teddies. So you can see all these kind of teddies lined up and, uh, and she's there being the teacher to these teddies. It's very cute. And, uh, and we use this to our advantage, I must say, being a very tricky parent. Uh, so that when it comes to spellings practice, she likes still to be in role. And so she likes to test me on my spellings. <laughs> and, uh, and I must admit, sometimes I do struggle still with some of them. Uh, and, uh, but I must admit, I am a little bit cheeky. Because I go along with it, but I use it as a bit of a test. She'll ask me how to spell Wednesday, that's the sort of thing we're asking to spell at the moment, Wednesday, or Tuesday, or Saturday, or tomorrow is another one. And, uh, and I, some of them I'll get right, some of them I won't get right. And I'll see whether she uh, notices or not. You see, cheeky daddy <laughs> is testing our young daughter, misspelling words to see if she catches it. You know, there's a a famous preacher called Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he'd do something similar. He would ask a tricky question of people to test their understanding, to see whether they could spot the mistake. You know, he would ask people, are you a Christian? And he'd look at what their response would be. And for people who like to think of themselves as Christians there would be a surprising number of them that would say something like this. Well, I'm trying, or I try my best. Enormous number of people would answer it like that. And what he said was this. He said that would belie the fact that they had no idea what the starting point of the Christian faith is. That The Christian faith is fundamentally 
a change in status. You're either in the family or you're not uh, in the family. That was, if you like, the justified word. You're either saved or you aren't. And so what we see here is Moses calls out to the people and he says this, what do we have to do? How do we cross through the river? What we need to do is stand still. And it's interesting when Moses is uh, singing a song about this passage, um, he says exactly that. He speaks of it and he says, um, he points to these words. He says uh, in Exodus 15, whose hand was it that was stretched out? Interesting. God says to Moses, stretch out your hand. And yet when Moses, reflecting on this, uh, on this experience, sings a song of how God has delivered his people, he says this. It was your right hand, Moses says. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. And I bet for some of those, uh, some of those Israelites walking through with the sea on their right and the sea on their left, a wall of sea around them, walking through uh, that sea on dry ground. Some of them would have been, I bet, walking along and absolutely dumbfounded at what they were seeing around them. They were looking to their left, they were looking to their right, and they were saying, this is amazing. This is amazing what God is doing. Look at how God's hand is at work. See how we are experiencing God's blessing. Isn't it incredible? But I bet there were some of them that were walking through and they were looking to their left and their right and they were petrified at what they were seeing. They thought they were going to die any minute. And what we see here is that lesson at work that actually it was not the quality of these Israelites' faith. It was what their faith was in. It was, where, it was the object of their faith, not how much faith they had. These people were saved by God's grace. And so why is it that they got out? Ooh, excuse me. Why is it possible that they got out? You know, last week um, I uh, I went out with the uh, Inspire group, um, is, which is our, our um, ages uh, school ages six to seven, and uh, and we were talking about this whole kind of sweep of the Exodus story, and and, and they were asking tough questions, tough questions about the story of the Exodus, and uh, weren't they, Kathy? And I was, I, was, I was scratching my head a little bit, trying to work out what to, what to say and how we would um, respond to some of these things. And they were asking things like this. You know, it seems unfair, doesn't it? <coughs> that God seems to have it in for the Egyptians, and yet these Israelites get away scot-free. You know, we weren't talking specifically about this passage, but actually, is it that the Israelites were any more deserving or any, any more right than the Egyptians? Are the Israelites any better than them? And we have to say, no. It seems to me that the Egyptians just have more technology. They have better chariots and and they're they're, they're better horsemen than uh, the Israelites. So why is it that if God's water of judgment stands on either side and comes down on the Egyptians, why is it that it doesn't come down on the Israelites as well? And the answer we see through this passage, why is it that God saves the Israelites? Is that they have someone standing between them and God. They have uh, a mediator. What we see here is one man representing the people to God, Moses. And he stands and he hears the cries of the Israelites and he represents those cries to God. And we have one man, Moses, who hears God speak to him and is obedient to God and what God asks him to do. 
and chooses to stretch out his hand and parts the Red Sea. God's power working through Moses. And uh, one guy, um, Tim Keller, he's an American um, pastor and preacher, um, says this. Here you have one man who is so identified with the Israelites that their guilt is upon him. You know, much later on in, uh, in the story of the Exodus, Moses, when he's up with uh, receiving the Ten Commandments and God's people are down um, below, uh, building idols, b- building a golden calf, breaking the first two commandments, <laughs> right there, right there and then. Moses even goes forward to offer his own life so that God's anger wouldn't break out on his people. Here we see Moses, so identified with the Israelites that the guilt of all the people is upon him. But also a man so identified with God that the power of God works through him, literally through his outstretched arms, to be a vehicle of God's saving power. That's Moses. One man who's able to represent the people before God and one man who's through whom the power of God is at work. But what we see is that Moses is not perfect either. In just a few chapters time, as I've said before, Moses himself messes up. He is not perfect. And what we see here is that just with Moses who messes up, We need a perfect mediator. In the language of uh, of Hebrews, we need someone who is greater than Moses to come. And this would be someone, Jesus, of course. He wouldn't just divide waters. He would walk on top of those waters. That actually even those waters, those waters of judgment, would fall upon him, just as it fell upon the Egyptians. As we reflect upon Jesus on the cross, do you remember the plagues, the ten plagues? As Jesus is on the cross, what we see is darkness covers the earth. One of those ten plagues, multiple of those plagues, were upon Jesus. He experiences those plagues that we might have freedom in him. And so this is a great story. Um, It's a story that speaks to us as well. Because I don't know about you, but I struggle to be still. I do. I do. I need to know what it means to be still. I struggle when it says, stand firm, stand in grace. You know, when I'm fearful... There's nothing like uncertainty for the future. There's nothing like remembering that that somehow, in some way, just as it says in Romans 8, God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. And what we see in this passage is that wonderful picture for you and for me of how we are both saved, but there's an ongoing work to go on in our lives. The process continues for God's people beyond this moment. They need to continue to learn these lessons of the unforced rhythms of grace in their lives. You know, John Wimber um, put it like this. Um, he, uh, a pastor from the vineyard says this. He said, the way in is the way on. The way in is the way on. And here God's people see God's amazing deliverance yet again but they will need to continue to learn this lesson just as we do. That actually the way through those waters is by grace because of what Jesus has done for us, our perfect mediator. But that is the way we continue in the Christian life. We continue in grace. We continue by putting our faith in Jesus.